You're watching Word Alive Bible Study at Word Tabernacle Church. I need a word, life life changing word. A place of relevant ministry where relationships are built, needs are met, purpose is fulfilled, and God is enjoyed. Join us now as we get stronger, grow deeper, and go higher. Stronger, deeper, and higher every day. What I want to do today, and I don't normally do this, but I think when we're talking about submission like we're going to these next few weeks, I, I want to approach this topically. And I, I rarely do that, but because we've arrived here in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, I really want to spend some time massaging this issue because I think if we get it right, it has significant implications for the health of our marriages, the health of our families, the health of our institutions, if we get this issue right. The truth of the matter is we don't generally do submission well. Um, and when we do submit, sometimes we're doing it like holding our nose, you know, like, I don't really wanna do this, but I know I have to. And my, my bad attitude causes me to miss out on the blessing of my obedience. That's a great word for another time. Um, so Ephesians chapter five, as we've been discussing, the Apostle Paul, as he writes to the church of Ephesus, has now shifted from theology to application. He's shifted, he spent several chapters really honing in on theology. Now he makes it real. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where I begin living it out <clears throat> in my life. And in Ephesians chapter five, verse 22, and I wanna reference two other places as well here in Ephesians before we start teaching officially. Ephesians 5.22, Paul writes now, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, let me just say this very quickly. This is really a jab at culture. A lot of times people misunderstand why he references to your own husband and not just, you know, wives submit to your husbands versus to your own husband. This is a jab at culture because as Paul writes this, He's writing in a culture that operates with a patriarchal hierarchy. Let me tell you why this matters. The patriarchal hierarchy of that time caused whoever the father was to make decisions unilaterally for the family. So when a woman got married, she still had a father and that father literally had the authority over that new home as well. So this is why, so he's taking a jab at, at culture here, and he's saying, listen, you know, you get married, you know, your daddy don't run things anymore. So this is a very important concept, so to watch what he does now. So he says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Jot that down, say that out, as to the Lord. Now, notice what he says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now, I'm going to read, I'm going to spend more time beyond this next week, so I'm only going to, I'm going to stop there. But go to chapter 6, chapter 6, verse 1. In chapter 6, verse 1, it, he, he gives the next human relationship. Children, obey your parents. Pay attention to that in the Lord, right? Jot that down, say that, in the Lord, right? Now, look at verse five of chapter six. He goes to the next earthly relationship, right? Which is like employer-employee kind of thing. Bond servants, obey your heavenly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. Now, this is very important. So I want you to understand Paul is really, really so smart because he's if you if you look at chapter six, verse one real quick. If you notice, when we talk about parent children, for example, we generally put it in the order of parent child. We don't usually say child parent. Right. And when we think about our, our, our relationships in terms of employers and employees is usually employer first, employee first. And if you notice here in chapter five, he talks about wives first and then husbands. Normally, the hierarchy would be man and then woman. 
The point that Paul is making here is that there has to be a mutual submission. It's a very important concept. So let me let's let's just be honest here. If we would if we were to think about um, and, I, you know, I, I was thinking about things that people just get wrong. How many times have you ever heard people say this is just, you know, marriage made in heaven? There are no marriages made in heaven. Right. Every marriage is made on earth. This is very important. When Paul talks about marriages, when he talks about parents and children, when he talks about uh, slaves and masters or employers and employees, these are all earthbound relationships. But this is what Paul is saying. In order for it to honor God, we have to take this earthbound relationship and we have to lift it to a high, a holy and a heavenly place which is why he keeps referencing in all three references to Jesus, references to God. He says all of this is unto God. And this is why. And this is I'm going to make this thing. I'm hoping the Holy Ghost will let me make this easy. This is, what, this is why he keeps saying, and let me read it to you again, because I don't want us to miss this. I don't want us. I don't want it to be lost on us. Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Right. Chapter six. Children obey Parents, in the Lord. Chapter 6, verse 5. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters as you would Christ. He taking an earthly relationship, lifting it to a heavenly realm. And this is the logic. The logic is, who have you ever met that met Jesus, fell in love with Jesus, made Jesus Lord and Savior, and did not willingly do everything they could for him? He said, that's how you get to think of it. You love him. You fell in love with him. He's your Lord and Savior. You, you don't have to be coddled and begged and forced and manipulated. You're going to do you're just willingly going to do everything you can. That's the concept he's talking about. Now, what I want to do today is I want to just make some statements about submission as we massage this issue. And I'm going to really take my time with this. Here's the first statement I want to make about submission. The first statement about submission is that we have to recognize that when we desire that which was never intended to be delivered, the result is disappointment and disillusionment. Now, that's a mouthful. This is what I'm trying to get you to see. God intended our earthly relationships to be seasoned and, and executed and lived out in an environment of submission. When we approach, whether it's our job, when we approach our marriage, when we approach our parenting and our children from a lens of nobody's gonna tell me what to do, then the only result that can come out of that is disappointment. Because what God has done is God has saying, I am I'm placing in the context of relationship, submission. And whenever you step out of submission, the end result is disappointment and disillusionment. I will never get out of a relationship that which God intended unless I honor the context that he puts me in the relationship. This is so, so people wonder, why, why, why am I so unhappy at home? Because you won't listen. What, my job, I'm miserable. Because I, I want to be the boss. I want to be told what to do. That's not the context of the relationship. And so we get disappointed and we get disillusioned over situations because I'm expecting it to deliver something that God never intended for it to deliver. So this is then we if we were to think about this. Let's be let's just ask ourselves, why is it, why is submission so difficult? You know, and I, I was thinking about this, you know, because I've had my seasons in life where I was just like, I'm just not going to. I mean, we everyone who reads this is clear. God requires it. You know, he's it's not like he's minced words. He's like, look, this is what I'm expecting. Um, so I got to thinking about that thing and I, I started realizing and this is going to show up as I make other statements. Submission is difficult because. It requires engagement and confrontation, which requires me to learn to be different. 
which means in a very real way, this is why, this is why there is a biblical admonition, encouragement, recommendation. Uh, it's probably not a good idea to marry somebody not saved. The reason that's such a big deal to God is because God recognizes that when we get placed inside of relationships, human relationships that require us to submit to someone, that submission then requires me to be healthy enough to respond to that person's authority. And many times we're not healthy enough to do that. So I want to park here for a moment. I want to spend time on this. And let me just let me, you know, exhale while I'm teaching this because I'm going to deal with all of the things you're thinking about. God is not saying submit yourself to toxicity. He's not saying submit yourself to abuse. This is why over and over again, he gives the recommend. He says, use Jesus as the example, the way Jesus sacrificed for the church. That's the kind of submission I'm asking you to submit to. So, so I, I want you to understand that. But I want us to understand that this requires a level of health for me. So let me say some things about that. And I jotted down a lot of different points to make sure that when I get into the relationship, I'm already a healthy person. I think too many times we enter into something, we're not healthy, and then I wind up railing against authority, and I'm railing against authority because that authority is requiring something of me that I'm not willing or ready to be. So we wind up fighting against the concept of submission when in reality, submission is there to drive me to be a better person if I'm indeed willing to be that better person, whether it is with my child, my boss, or my spouse, my pastor. So let me say a few things about this because I was processing this. I'm like, God, why? <clears throat> because when I'm in a relationship with you, and I have to submit to you, whether it's at work, whether it's at home, whether it's with my parents, whether it's at church, it requires some stuff of me. So let me give you some examples. It requires, for example, that I don't keep making the same mistakes over and over again, right? So because if I'm in a submissive relationship, I'm gonna get corrected on how, where I'm wrong. I have to then be healthy enough, I think the word I'm looking for, is not toxic. I can't be a toxic person where I just keep making the same mistake over and over again and I refuse to submit to correction. I can't be, and this is everything, and let me tell you where I'm at in the text. Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. What then do we know about Christ being head of the church? We, we, we know that means that, that Christ could not be self-absorbed, right? It had to be about us. It had to be about somebody else. So embedded in this means I can't be self-absorbed. I can't be manipulative. Um, I, I have to be a person that, you know, I can't play the victim. Um, I can't walk around with bouts of anger. I can't have a hidden agenda. Um, I mean, I could say so much more about this. And what I want you to grab is that submission does not work if I'm pursuing my own mission. Um, submission does not work if I have a passive aggressive behavior. Um, submission does not work when I'm ignoring boundaries that have been set. It doesn't work when um, I'm, I'm, I'm malicious talking and I, so, I have to be a healthy person to be in the relationship to begin with because there's going to be an element of submission required. Let me, let me say a second thing. This means, secondly, as it relates to submission, we are equally and uniquely created in God's image. So when he talks about this submission here with husbands and wives, wives submitting, be clear, woman or man, we are equally made in the image of God. We are, but I want you to get this, but we are uniquely created in the image of God. So that means we have unique aspects to us. It means that, that 
I'm not better than you or bigger than you, but we have different roles, different expectations, different aspects of our life. So let me talk, let me talk about this for a minute. Um, because I think this is really important. I hope I don't get too deep with this because I really want us to understand this. When we look, matter of fact, if, if, if you look at 1 Corinthians, um, I think it's chapter 11, verse 3. Um, if we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, as an example, we start to see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, God is revealing or establishing the principle of hierarchical structure, right? Very important. God is establishing in scripture that there is a structure of hierarchy in his creation, right? He says the head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is the man. The head of Christ is God. There is a hierarchical structure in God's creation, right? And the same issue of hierarchy is even seen um, it's even in an unseen spirit world. Now, I don't want to get too deep with this, but this is why we read about principalities and powers. Look at the language of the scriptures. Rulers of the world of darkness. Wicked spirits. Look at the hierarchical structure in high places. I'm going somewhere, y'all. We read about Satan being prince of the power of the air who presides over fallen demonic forces, right? Over and over again, we get hints of hierarchical structure in the Bible, unfallen angels, thrones, dominions, angels, archangels, cherubim, seraphim, hierarchical structure embedded in God's creation. Now, this is important. The unifying factor in all of God's creation is hierarchy, order, and structure. This is important. Sin introduces disorder. It introduces chaos. Um, you know, you think about it. Sin is manifested on the earth in Genesis when Adam and Eve defy God's authority. This is very important. So submission is important for us as believers because when I'm not being submissive, I'm operating under a satanic curse and influence. And the way I lift the curse off of my family, off of my marriage, off of my church, off of my business is having a willingness to submit and understanding that in the submission, we are equally but just uniquely created in God's image. Let me say a third thing. Um, the third thing I want to say about submission as we introduce this subject is headship is leadership and responsibility. Um, headship is leadership and responsibility. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church. That means if I'm going to be the head, it requires that I lead and it requires I be responsible. And this is a very important concept because I think oftentimes as men, we wanna, we wanna just throw this verse out and show no leadership. We wanna throw this verse out, show no responsibility. If, if, if she is submitting, I am being a leader. If she's submitting, I am being responsible. And I'm gonna talk more about what that looks like, right? So. I think it's very important that we keep this in the context of, man, you don't get to be the head if you're not showing leadership. You want her to submit to what? Right. I don't get to be the head if I'm not being responsible. And let me just say this really important concept here. Um, responsibility does not mean I do it all. It means I have responsibility for it. Like, it's got to be on somebody. So, you know, Jesus delegates, right? He, the father sends him, and then he's, he's going um, to ascend, and then he says, I'm going away, I'm going to send you another comforter. He sends the Holy Spirit. And then, and then Father, as you sent me, so I send them. But the responsibility is there. I can delegate it, but there's got to be responsibility. 
And so we have to recognize that, you know, this is why those of us who are in leadership, man, they, we will tell you it's a lot of responsibility. I mean, it's no, I mean, I don't, this is no diss. I hope y'all hear my heart. I'm not, this is no diss about people who work at the hospital or who work, you know, at the engine plant or work at Firestone, you know, I mean, we need y'all. Thank y'all for what y'all do. You know, we need tires and engines and logistics. And I mean, it's all, it all matters to God. But check this out. When you clock out, when your shift ends, you done for the moment. When, you're, when you have leadership responsibilities, you're, you're never off. It's always something, you're still responsible. You know, if, if I go home, at 7 p.m., if something happens at 1 a.m., as the pastor, I'm still responsible, right? So we have to recognize the high demand of headship, the high demand. I mean, literally like this head, right? It, it, it has a very clear leadership role, and these hands have only moved because of the headship. And so we've got to recognize, and I think the reason this is important is because I just don't want women hearing this lesson and feeling like God is communicating just because you are a man, you are worthy of me submitting to. And I don't want men feeling like, well, because I'm a man, you just do what I say. No, this, this assumes leadership and responsibility. Let me say a fourth thing about this. And I'm hoping this whole concept will help people. Submission, let me just, so we can define terms. Submission is the voluntary yet expected response to godly leadership. That, that, that's the working definition for this teaching about submission. It is the voluntary yet expected response to godly leadership. Now, the natural question is going to be, what does godly leadership look like? I know you're asking that, right? So let's talk about that, because if I'm supposed to voluntarily, if I'm expected to voluntarily submit to this leadership, what does that leadership look like? Let me, let me, let me give you, a, these aren't in your notes, but jot these few things down if you're taking notes. This leadership looks, first of all, like sacrifice. Because he says, as Christ is head of the church, his body and and um, his church, his body, and is himself its savior. Oh, I'm going to teach that in a minute. Um, so this godly leadership looks like sacrifice. That means God is saying, look, if you have someone in your life who's making sacrifice for you, you can submit to that person. So it's about sacrifice, first of all. It's not about me coming up. It's not about woman, bring me my slippers. You know, it's not about, I mean, we are not Neanderthals. You know, we don't come, we're not walking around with our knuckles dragging the ground with our, with our bat, you know, behind us, and we're trying to manipulate and abuse. No, leader, godly leadership says I'm sacrificing. People are looking at my life, and they're saying, man, he's putting it on the line. He's putting himself last. He's making sure everybody else is good. I can, I can get down with that. I can submit to that. So godly leadership, first of all, looks like sacrifice. And I think too many times, whether we are leaders in churches, leaders in our homes, leaders in our schools, leaders on our campuses, we want people to do what we say, and they see no sacrifice in us. They don't see us staying late. They don't see us grinding harder. They don't see us trying harder. They don't see us innovating. They don't see us putting ourselves last. So number one is sacrifice. The second thing I want you to jot down or think about process as it relates to godly leadership is seriousness. Like I'm really taking on my manhood and womanhood seriously. Like the same way that I'm always reading monthly on being a better preacher. I ought be reading regularly on being a better man, a better husband, a better father. We should be desiring to seriously take on the leadership role that God has given us so that people see that I am making effort in being a better. This is why, this is why, hey, just real, just real talk. 
and we're coming back to our normal schedule, this is why I come to men's roundtable. This is why I come to women's roundtable. This is why I attend marriage events. I tell couples all the time, don't, when you get married, find a marriage retreat every other year or every year. Take a weekend where it's just about, I'm trying to be a better spouse. Because people that have been married for 25, 30 years, they'll tell you, it's not 25, 30 years of bliss. And I told you before, that whole this, my marriage was made in heaven. Stop that. Your marriage was made on earth. And earth is fallen. And earth has issues. And earth has problems. And earth has toxicity. And earth has anger. And earth has resentment and bitterness. Your marriage was not made in heaven. It was made on earth with a lens of heaven and high and holy places so that we could operate in it the way God desires. And the only way I can do that is to show forth godly leadership. So I'm being sacrificial, I'm being serious. But the third issue here about this God leadership, and this is what we see in Christ as the head of the church, sacrifice, seriousness, sanctification. Um, you know, I, I'm, Christ makes me better. Say amen, type amen if you can. He, he makes me holier. He, he, he sanctifies me, right? He's, I'm a better person because of Jesus. No question about it. And anyone listening to me teach, you should, if you don't have the testimony that, that I'm a better person, I'm a more sanctified person because of Jesus, I would suggest you haven't met him yet. We are better because of Jesus. Watch where I'm going. That means godly leadership means my spouse is better because of me. My home is better because of me. My job is better because of me. There's a sanctifying nature to what we do. My children are healthier and happier and provided for because of me. So my leadership should lead to sanctification. It should lead, you know, this is, I mean, it's, I, boy, I don't, I don't wanna get myself in too much trouble here. But uh, let me just say this. God has not made the woman who is not wired to submit to godly leadership. She don't exist from God. So if I have submission problems at home, I need to ask myself, what's wrong with my leadership? Because if my leadership is on point, God has ordained it that there will be submission on a voluntary basis and expected voluntary submission because of the sanctification. Now, if you cursing at her, harming her, manipulating her, cheating on her, You've created an environment where you are not showing forth godly leadership. That's not how Jesus treats the church. So it's sacrificial, it's serious, it's sanctifying. Um, you know, I'm, you know, you should just look better, happier. You know, it's like it breaks my heart when I see folk, man, at work, and or at you know church or at home. And they just look so beat up. When you and now I need you to go back to what I said at the beginning. Sometimes this is not because you don't have godly leadership. Sometimes it's because you're that person I talked about in the beginning where you just not healthy enough on your own to respond to it. But if you're a healthy person and serious about responding, then relationships should lift me. They should they should create a joy and a peace and an appreciation. And so this godly leadership needs to be sacrificial, it needs to be serious, meaning there's effort here at improving who, I, who God has made me to be. There needs to be sanctifying, which means the people around me in my home are made better because of my presence. And the last word I want you to write down is just sensitivity. That there is an element of sensitivity where as the leader, I'm sensing the spirit of my own environment and I'm learning how to respond to that spirit that I'm sensing, that I'm, that I, I'm recognizing when people are sad. I'm sensitive, I'm sensitive to the fact that people are having struggles, that, that people have questions, that, that, that my spouse is not good, that I'm sensing this. And so as part of godly leadership is, is, is not just being the thermostat, where I choose what the temperature is in the atmosphere, part of godly leadership is being the thermometer, where I'm like, ooh, you're a little, 
You're a little cool. You know, you're, you're a little, you're, okay, I need to warm you up a little bit, right? I, there has to be an element of sensitivity of, wow, babe, you had a tough day. You know, I can talk about what's on my mind later. Or, hey, babe, you know what? I noticed that, you know, every time I open up my mouth, it's always about me. You know, let me be more sensitive to you. Um, my children, you know, recognizing, wow, you know, you, you, don't, you don't seem like you want to go to school like you used to. You don't seem, you're not hanging with those same group of friends. What, what happened? So godly leadership that we submit to is sacrificial, it is serious, it is sanctifying, and it is sensitive. Let me say a fifth thing. The fifth thing I want to say about submission is that submission to anyone or anything that displays strong, moral, and loving headship is an act of elevation and enrichment. Um, so me submitting elevates me. See, we view it as it makes me less than it doesn't. You know, when I submit to my fathers in ministry, it doesn't make me a lesser pastor. It elevates me and enriches me as a pastor. I want my young people to hear this. When you are submitting to your parents, it's, it's elevating you. It, it's enriching you. It is making you better. And so when we respond to people or situations that have a strong, moral, and loving headship, you know, and this is why I think it's so important that, you know, as parents, we, and we're going to talk about children and parents later on in this teaching on submission when we get to chapter six. You know, but I think part of our discipline of our children is because we love them. You know, like the difference between me disciplining a child and some stranger in the street, I have love for my child. So when I'm telling you what is right, when I'm correcting you, when I'm punishing you, it is not because I hate you, it is because I love you. And when you respond to that kind of loving leadership and headship, that act of submission elevates you. And I've seen this so many times in people's life where, and jot this down is what in my notes to say, just Holy Spirit just kind of dropped it in my spirit. But submission is a tool for promotion. Um, I see this over and over again. I don't get to be number one unless I learn to submit to number one when I was number five, when I was number two. You know, and I think too many times we want to go right to the head and we've not spent any time in submission to who was at the head. So we view submission as, you know, what, well, you know, you're a man just like I'm a man. You put your pants on just like I put my pants on. Well, no, view submission as a tool for promotion. View it as, hey, you know, as I am submitting, as I am lovingly saying yes to your godly leadership, it is now enriching me, promoting me, elevating me, it's making me better. It's connecting me with the head. It is connecting me with the one who God has put in authority. You know, it's that whole, you ever had your food paid for by the car in front of you, you know, at the drive through you know, you, you, you got waved through because of who was in front of you, right? That's, I mean, that's just how it works, you know? So you in front of me, you paid for my stuff, they tell you keep going because you then got connected with who was in front of you. And I see this all the time, like too many times, we're like, God, I have learned, man, connect yourself with people God is blessing. Connect yourself with people that God is elevating. Connect yourself with people that God is doing great things in their life because as they go, so you go. So don't view submission from this, from this demonic, satanic perspective. View it from a godly instruction perspective where as I submit, it's an act of elevation and enrichment. So don't let your friends, young people, you know, tease you and taunt you and bully you around you know, I can't believe your parents won't let you do A, B, and C. Why well, won't, I don't believe your parents won't let you do this. View your act of submission to your parents as your way of being elevated and promoted and your life being enriched. Let me, let me, let me, let me hang out just a minute longer. If we were to go back to the garden, we see, and I want you to see the power of this, and I hope, women, I hope y'all will You'll just stick with me as I try to struggle through this. When you go back to the garden, 
God creates man first. I mean, you, you can't deny that, right? I mean, he creates man first. When he creates man first, he places in Adam the position of headship. It doesn't make Adam better than Eve. It's just, it's no different than, you know, I'm, I'm teaching that doors in the studio I'm teaching it. And, and it, you know, between the media people and a handful of people here, if there's no way all of us can get out of that door the exact same time. It doesn't mean whoever goes through first is better. It just means there has to be a created order or else there's chaos. Right now, now watch this. So Eve then is created. I'm taking us back to Genesis. Eve is created and she is not created subservient. She's not given a subservient position relative to man. So watch this. This is so important. So Adam is made. How can I say this? Adam was made to be ruled from his head. Eve is made to be ruled from her heart. They're not better, just different. Now watch what happens. If you go back to Satan tempting Adam and Eve, if you notice what Satan does so masterfully is he swaps their roles. So he has an intellectual conversation with Eve. Did God really say? And by her then accepting on headship, chaos and sin is introduced. And then Johnny come lately, Adam then is now being ruled by his heart because she's like, hey, baby, this ain't so bad. He's not being engaged intellectually. He's now being ruled in his heart. So God then in the new creation reestablishes the original order. Man is head under Christ. The woman is to acknowledge the headship of the man. It is how God is creating an order in our nation, our world, our homes, our churches, our organizations. Let me say a sixth thing. Um, <clears throat> Leadership requires initiation and engagement. So when we look at this issue about submission and man being the head, it requires man to do initiation, to initiate things. It requires man to engage the woman. So this is very, very important because if I'm a leader, that people are submitting to. If I'm asking you to submit to my leadership in the church or in the home, it requires that I actually lead, which means I have to engage. You see, it's not, it's not submission if I'm dragging you by the hair and making you. Submission requires engagement. It requires me acknowledging, let me give you a sub point to this. <clears throat> it's me acknowledging your skill and ability. So, Leadership requiring engagement um, and initiation means I'm not forfeiting skills or abilities. So this is why everyone in the home, everybody in our home has skills. Everyone in our home has very clear abilities. And so I think we get into the mistake, and I have said this so many times for those families, and you have to do what you have to do in your home, but I, I do believe biblically God is saying to us, whoever does it well, let them do it. So part of this godly leadership and this submission is recognizing the wife, the husband, the children, everyone have skills and ability. And just because I'm the head does not mean I'm asking you to abandon the skill and ability you have been given by God. You know, when I um, when I perform marriage ceremonies, you know, I often spend a moment saying, you know, that passage where it says and two became one. And what I say to couples is which one? You know, they look at me kind of puzzled. Right. I'm like, well. Is it you? Are you the one or are you the one? Since it says y'all become one. And, and obviously the answer is neither. Right. You become a new one. Right. And this new one does not require me to abandon 
the skill and ability that God has given me, this new one that is formed literally embraces my skill and ability, brings it into the new union so that our submission and our leadership and our headship is taken into account each other's skills and abilities. Um, you know, I, I, I joke, you know, but like if you get married and you like hot and you like sweet, you're going to still like hot and sweet after you become one. The issue becomes that when I cook, if I like hot and you like sweet, I can't always cook hot. I have to also think about sweet because I can't forfeit who you are. And I think oftentimes when we think about men, we have to do a better job of this. We we can't be so, you know, just totalitarian and so dictatorial that we force who we are on other people and not fully embrace and accept their unique skills and abilities and giftedness. And so leadership requires this level of initiation and engagement. I, I need to, I'm, I really want to finish this sheet so I can go in a different direction next week. So let me go quick. Um, where are we at? Number seven. Headship is accountability. And so I think oftentimes when we think about this issue of wives submitting to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ. This is the key expression. Even as Christ is the head of the church, there is a level of accountability attached to my headship. And so I think we, we, we forget as men, wives submit to man as man submits to God. So this is really, really critical and a little scary and just something we need to keep in mind. God, I'm talking to those in headship now, God is holding us accountable for those under our leadership that have been submitting to us that they look better under our leadership than they did before our leadership. So God holds you accountable, man, for your wife, because I want you to understand this. She is his creation. And God has given us a stewardship responsibility over all of his creation. And God is now saying to us as fathers, as husbands, as pastors, as leaders, whatever I have given you headship over, I am holding you accountable to make sure it is better as a result of your leadership. So you, brother, listen, man, you've been beating your wife. You got some repenting to do and some fixing to do. You've been abusing your kids. You have repenting to do and fixing to do. Because don't, and see, this is very important. I'm just going to hope this ministers to somebody, and I'm hoping this is making sense. I don't normally take this approach topically, but I just really felt like it needs some time and discussion. Um, you know, women being abused is, is one of the things I just have zero tolerance for. And let me tell you, there's a... There's a pattern that I've seen over the years. So we see this at Reach. We see this with other organizations that work with groups of people. That women who are viewed as not having anyone covering them tend to be more vulnerable to abusive men. So when you, um, this is why people that, um, you know, one of the things that violent, manipulative men will do is they'll try to get you detached from your family, right? They don't want you having friends. They don't want you going to see your mom and dad. They don't want, so if you have a man, I'm just going, this is for somebody. I don't know why I'm saying this, but it must be for someone. If you have a man in your life that's trying to peel off every relationship where it's just going to be the two of you, I'm here to tell you that is a, that's a warning sign. And you should, not, you should not ignore that warning sign. So watch what happens. When a man sees a woman, she doesn't have a big brother. She doesn't have a dad. She doesn't have uncles. She doesn't have any men in her life that she has close relationships with. It is those kinds of situations that oftentimes men feel like they can, they can lord over that person. And this is what I want you to hear, man. God is holding you accountable for how you treat that person. I think this is a great word for just in the church. You know, we think we have, we think nobody's watching. We think nobody is aware. 
Listen, I want you to understand something. We get away with zero. We get away with nothing. And you've heard me say this before, but I'm going to say it again because I want some. We have a lot of new people who haven't heard it. The only difference between God and man in this, in this sense is that God settles his accounts at a different time. Man tends to settle his accounts weekly, monthly, but I'm going to have my account settled. And, and so I want you to hear my heart for a moment. If you are in an abusive, violent, um, emotionally, it doesn't have to be physically, it could be emotionally abusive. It could be verbally abusive. I want to encourage you to seek counsel. Get counsel. I want to encourage you to find a trusting person that you can share your story with and your journey with. And I want to encourage you that if, if that violent, um, hostile, toxic environment, that's not what God wants for you. And God is a reconciler. God is a restorer. God is a redeemer. And there is repentance and people do change. But I want to encourage you to seek that support and that help because headship is accountability. Number eight. Under godly leadership, I just started talking about this, there is no place for exploitation or abuse, but only flourishing. Um, that, that's, it speaks for itself. You know, what should happen in here is we should thrive. We should flourish. And, and y'all, I'm not talking about perfection. We know there are no perfect environments. But there ought to be a spirit and a desire to see men and women thrive and flourish. You know, this is one of the reasons why when I do my marriage ceremonies, um, I add a line. And if you've heard me perform a, a wedding, you've heard me say this. One of the things I added to my wedding vows is I have the couple say to each other, I will honor your goals and your dreams and help you fulfill them. Because if I'm in an environment where you're the only one winning, you're the only one thriving, you're the only one flourishing, you're the only one being fulfilled, you're the only one accomplishing your goals, you're the only one fulfilling your dreams, that is a form of exploitation and abuse. In godly leadership, in godly relationships, God is saying everyone in the relationship should thrive. Everyone should accomplish their goals and dreams. Um, I don't know who this is for, but I'm feeling the Holy Spirit causing me to say this. You know, I, I see this over and over again where women have set aside their ambitions, their dreams, so that they could support, they could be a helpmate to the goals and dreams of their husband. And I am not knocking that. I'm not against that. I encourage that. I support that. However, the time should come in your life where it gets to be your turn. You know, I've seen people put their dreams on hold so their children could go to college. And rightfully so, I'm a parent and I know the sacrificial nature. You know, it's a 25, 30 year, it's probably just a lifetime, right? But at some point, you, need to, you get to go back to school. At some point, you get to start your business. At some point, you get to have your dream vacation. And so under godly leadership, there is no place for abuse or exploitation. Number nine. Um, there are limits to both our leadership and our submission. Um, let me show you where this is in verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. I'm sorry, verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. That means there's limitations. See, I'm not anybody's savior. And I think too often times we approach leadership and submission from the lens of I'm going to change you. I'm going to fix you. No, 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 no. I'm, 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 listen to me. Let me tell you something that we are flawed with from 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 the garden. We are flawed with this mindset of wanting to control what we create. And so when I think I have made you that I want to control you. When I think you are what you are because of me, I created you, I made you, I helped you get there, that I have this, in, this flawed perspective to want to control that. So we have to recognize that our identity is in Christ, our making is in Christ, and that there is a limitation to my leadership. I can't save you. 
And I think too often times as leaders, we take on this God perceptive, this God persona where I'm trying to be God. I'm trying to be all things to everyone. I'm trying to fix everything. I'm trying to no. we have a limit to our leadership and there is a limit to our submission. You know, and, and the limit to our submission is you ought not be leading me down a path that doesn't honor God. You ought not be leading in a way that doesn't honor God. And so we, we, we get flawed because what we do is we read verse 24, where it says, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. But we don't look at how that everything gets modified. It is modified as per Christ. Now, as a church submits to Christ, the, the, the assumption here is I am submitting to everything that God is in. I'm submitting to everything that God is doing. I'm submitting to everything, to everyone that God is using. But I'm not submitting to your abuse and your neglect and your exploitation. So don't if you are in an abusive relationship and the man is quoting uh, Ephesians chapter five, verse 22 to you. And, and, you know, it is hurtful and harmful. That that is not what everything means in that passage. There is a limit to your leadership and there is a limit to our submission. I could never with a clear conscience, you know, the, the church. Yeah, you should submit to my leadership as I'm submitting to Christ. And, and if the time should ever come when I am leading us on a path that is no longer honoring the God, then there is no biblical requirement to follow my leadership. But I want you to be very clear about this. As long as I'm following him, there is a biblical requirement to follow my leadership. Number 10. We're almost we're out of time. So let me give you I got two more, three more. We submit out of love and devotion to Christ. Um, <laughs> this is why he says, as Christ is the head of the church, his body and himself, its savior. The church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit everything to their husbands. When I really love you and I'm really devoted to you, I submit to you. Y'all, receive this. Real love doesn't look for a loophole. Real love is not looking for a technicality. Real love is not looking for an escape clause. Real, real love is, is not saying stuff like, well, I don't tell because there's an Old Testament. Real, that, real love just submits, right? Real love is like, you know what? I love you. I'm devoted to you. I'm going to do it. I'm going I'm to submit. Number 11, submission is deferring, not demeaning. So when I submit, I am deferring to you, but I am not demeaning who I am. It is just simply me recognizing someone else's authority someone else's position. And as a result of that, I'm deferring to you, but it doesn't mean I'm dumb. It doesn't mean I'm stupid. It doesn't mean I'm not a critical thinker. It doesn't mean I'm not thinking for myself. It means I'm deferring to you, not demeaning. And then let number 12, and we're, we're done. Respect is the posture of submission. Um, respect is the posture of submission. I submit because I respect. Um, this is how I'm able to respond to my fathers in ministry or my accountability circle, because I don't always agree. But I submit out of respect. Um, let me give you a sub point to this. And this is a good word for young people. You are not going to agree with everything your parents say. You won't even understand everything they say. And you can't understand everything they say because you 14 and they 44. And they have a little bit more experience around, right? They, they, they've been around a little bit. But you submit out of respect for them. So here's the last comment. Respect is rooted in position. And so I don't talk negatively about my husband to people because he has the position of headship in our family and my respect for him is rooted in that position. I don't talk negatively about my pastor because my respect for my pastor or pastors is rooted in position. 
I don't talk negatively to my friends about my parents because my respect for them is rooted in their position. So I hope this will serve as a good primer for us to really understand this issue of submission. I'm going to start unpacking more of these verses. I'm going to probably need three weeks total on this. Two questions for you for this week, and then we'll pray. Um, the first question for this week is, who do I actively submit to? Um, you should be able to, you should have a list. I should have a list. Um, you know, I think this is why it's very important to have a church home. You know, because if you've got, you know, online preachers that you listen to, who are you submitting to? Right, there has to be an element of, this, of submission. So question one is, who do I actively um, submit to? And question two is, what should submission look like in our daily lives? What would be examples of submission in our everyday life? Um, and let me tell y'all, I've learned that if I get better at submitting to the lesser things, it's easier for me to submit to the greater, more difficult things. And so like if I can just, if I'm a young person, I can just make my bed, right? If I can just do my laundry, if I can just clean up after myself, if I can do that, then it becomes easier then for me to learn to submit because I've developed the discipline of submission. And so I think if our earthly relationships are going to honor heaven, they must have included in them an element of submission. And I would suge suggest and submit to us that whatever earthly relationship you are in, if it does not have an element of your submission, I would submit to you that it is a relationship that is not honoring to the Lord Jesus. And so I hope this helped. And I hope that as we study this as a church, we'll get stronger and we can better develop the discipline of our submission. Thanks for listening to Orthos. Hope you enjoyed today's Bible study. If you've got questions or comments or feedback, I'd love for you to share it with me. You can email me at james at jamesgalliard.com. I would also encourage you to follow me on one of my social media outlets. Go ahead and subscribe, either at Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or Instagram. Again, thanks for listening. 